Hello, my name is Kevin Del Rio. I've been meaning to find a way to get my feelings out there for games that I've fallen in love with. Today, I want to talk about fighting, which is at the heart of many games. There's just no shortage of it. Across the board, you will have to deal with conflict in all sorts of ways. By real time or turn by turn, you might be up close and personal or sniping from afar. I really love it though when a developer decides to take one mechanic and make it diverse and effective in a bunch of situations. For a certain blue hero and two of his rivals, I found that their basic armaments are powerful while being incredibly simple and easy to pick up from the start. And so, I invite you to get comfortable because I'm going to talk at length about Shovel Knight, Plague Knight, and Spectre Knight's campaigns all of which are currently available to play in the Treasure Trove package. Let's start with the shovel. So Shovel Knight came out in 2014 and surprised the world with a throwback to older NES games such as Mario Brothers, Zelda, Castlevania, and DuckTales. Since then, as with many other games, speedrunners and veterans alike have spent hours upon hours trying to perfect routes and strategies to zip through stages and annihilate foes. The shovel has two basic ways of interacting with the world. It can be swung, either in the air or on the ground, and while you're in the air you can press down to initiate the shovel drop, allowing you to bounce off obstacles or attack from above. It's very basic on the surface, but its applications stretch much further than that. Credit to why I love how this weapon works is to how Yacht Club games developed enemies and how they handle dealing damage back to you. Because if you run up to an enemy for a friendly hug, you'd think they were all covered in needles. Contact hurts, and that's to be expected in a lot of games, actually. But what some people don't realize immediately is that so long as you're dealing damage to an enemy, its hitbox won't deal damage back to you. So if you can manage to wail on a foe quickly enough, you can actually stay glued to them, which incentivizes players to be aggressive once they learn how to fight. Let's take a look at Polar Knight. I love his design because a lot of people will find out very quickly that they can't do what they might normally be getting away with up until this point. Dropping on his head repeatedly results in him shirking you off with a bunt to punish you for being uncreative. But Shovel Knight can jump to cancel the recovery of a shovel swing, and so with the right timing, you can easily stay on Polar Knight and use the pushback of your assault to decimate him from one side of the screen to the other. Once you learn how to attack like this, you'll be amazed at how you can apply it to other bosses and enemies to dispatch them in seconds. Now let's take a look at another application of the shovel. In the Iron Whale, there's a room with a bunch of tentacles. Newcomers will probably always do the room like this, as it's the intended way to clear out each arm and proceed through the room. But a well-informed player can time his swing to knock out the first tentacle, then quickly switch to a shovel drop and destroy the second one, removing the need to interact with these stone blocks at all. There are subtle techniques like this all over the game, ways that you can overcome troublesome enemies and obstacles quickly by showing a mastery of the basic toolkit. I haven't even covered reflecting projectiles, which the game doesn't really ever try to teach you through its own design. You might accidentally stumble upon it or miss whenever you've done it, because you've happened to attack right in an enemy's face and they just melted away because you also happened to slap their fireball back their way. But look at the Enchantress, the game's penultimate boss. You can deal an insane amount of damage to her, in the blink of an eye, she'll be half dead, and with an incredibly precise setup, you can even do one of the craziest maneuvers I've ever seen, and follow her beneath the floor to finish the job in a Hail Mary do or die finale. Shovel Knight by himself has floored me with just how complex and technical combat can be with only a couple of buttons. Now for Plague Knight, I want to start by talking about something that's intrinsic to his particular method of fighting. His movement. Plague Knight gets a lot of complaints and it breaks my heart because he's difficult or tricky to use and Yacht Club even admits it. He has the lowest completion rate of any campaign and I think it's criminal considering how much fun he is. In the very first level, the game has a pair of his minions show you exactly how to handle him. They throw a bomb, start glowing, and boom, they burst off. They even flap their arms to show you that this is the essence of Plague Knight's mobility. Plague Knight's at his best when he's airborne, but I've seen and heard many people try to approach the game like they did as Shovel Knight walking along, using the occasional double jump, and only bursting when they need to. Throwing bombs on the ground is one of the worst ways to attempt to remove a threat. However, if you try to do it from the air, Plague Knight even remains afloat for a few seconds, which allows you to add one more layer to your method of zooming around through every level. Did you know that Plague Knight's burst temporarily makes him invincible? 
Not just in the same way Shovel Knight can stay on top of his enemies while he's attacking. Plague Knight can straight up use his burst to dodge projectiles and hazards. Not spikes or being crushed, but spears, explosions, and whatever's in these pots and this dumb anchor that just wants to end your life. Let's apply what we know about Plague Knight to a fight I know a lot of people struggled on. Spectre Knight in the Lich Yard is one of the most frustrating fights for someone who doesn't know how to attack properly with Plague Knight. It takes a bit of understanding on how Spectre behaves, and speedrunners actually start this encounter by bursting just before they enter the screen so they can start up top, rather than under that pesky platform. Remember, you want the high ground as Plague Knight. By bursting as Spectre approaches, you can send him back to the other side, and he would try to come back to the left again, but another burst convinces him he should start his attack from the corner he came from. Throw a couple bombs, and then rather than chase him down, you set up your next attack in the same corner, dishing out a few more explosives before he'll start reacting to your assault. Now you pin him to the other corner, and this is where you'll need a little luck, but man is it satisfying. If he teleports to the same corner, you can just rain down on him and finish the fight before he has a chance to come back. Or if you're less lucky, you can still take him out quickly with a very tricky backup strategy. And this is with Plague Knight's basic bomb layout. You can totally change up what he throws, but a lot of people never bother to find the potential in what must be his favorite setup if he just starts out like this, right? Another example for Plague, because I know everyone hated this fight. Propeller Knight. He has a projectile guard, and it was actually nerfed after the game was released because of how frustrating it could be. A lot of people probably didn't make use of this handy item, and so for the first time in this video, I'll mention all the characters have incredibly powerful relics that they can use. Like, a lot of them. The Staff of Striking might have been what some people wanted for Plague Knight, considering it is a melee tool, but it's heavily limited by his resource meter, the power bar. Well, let's look at Propeller Knight to see how Plague can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this Master of the Skies. That thing about bursts I mentioned earlier? Well, you can use it to dodge Propeller's thrusts, and he's very content with jumping into an explosion to take some damage. That fancy hat of his? It doesn't protect him from your bombs at all. And to finish the job, follow him to his corner and show him what it's like to be struck down. Finally, let's talk about the Lich himself, Spectre Knight. For his campaign, they gave him a scythe, and they really wanted you to feel like you had some power in your hands. I'm going to be using Shovel Knight's shovel as a comparison, since the two are very relatable but distinctly different. It swings much faster than the shovel does, despite its size, and it has a huge range to boot. But you can't jump cancel it, which can make fighting enemies awkward at times, especially if you learned how to effectively handle the shovel blade first. And while Shovel Knight can drop down on enemies and bounce across hazards, Spectre uses his scythe in a dash attack that similarly combines mobility with offense. The big difference here is in the recovery. Mash as much as you like, but Spectre simply commits to his attacks a lot more than Shovel Knight does. Sometimes it's not really an issue. In fact, a lot of bosses still die very easily to repeatedly bouncing on their heads. So unlike Shovel Knight, who struggled with staying on quick enemies with his trusty drop, Spectre Knight's dash attack makes it very easy to repeatedly bonk a boss. Technically speaking, I gotta be honest, Spectre's Scythe is not very impressive on its own. Though there are a few maneuvers that add little complexity to his fights. Double hits are tricky to time, but allow you to slash twice at an enemy in the air rather than just once per given opportunity. Let's take a look at Mole Knight. He zooms by really quickly during his first phase. If you jump and time a slash before he's close enough to prompt a reticle, he'll actually dive straight into your attack, and before you land, you can cancel that regular side swing into a dash attack to hit him twice per pass. Without doing this, you'd be stuck having to deal with this move where he's completely invincible for a while. Let's ramp up the difficulty and try doing this to the Teethalon, a mini-boss only present in the Iron Whale. While Shovel and Plague Knight can finish this guy off before he zips across the screen. Under normal circumstances, Spectre won't be able to deal the 12 hits required to finish the job. But if you face the wrong way, you'll find out that Spectre's Scythe not only has a gigantic hitbox, it remains active for long enough to drift to the left so that you can hit the beast's weak spot before cancelling it with a slash attack. If you can pull this off enough times, you'll actually manage to one-cycle this guy. 
But if you really want to be impressed about Spectre, I'll have to start talking about his curios. This one in particular, the Bounding Soul, is commonly referred to as a basketball. When it's upgraded, it turns orange, and it pierces through enemies rather than dissipating on hit. This means that if you have an enemy unfortunate enough to be caught up against the wall, you can dribble them to death. Like Phantom Striker! One of Spectre's other curios, Judgment Rush, starts off the fight, allowing you to get in a prime position to launch the Bounding Souls. After firing them off, you reflect them back into the Phantom Striker while dashing at his back. He just lost over half his health. Did you catch that? Now watch the finish. As he's about to land, you fire one soul to the left, turn around, fire another soul to the right, and juggle an assault that deals over seven hits worth in just a few swings. So I hope it's plain to see why I love the combat in Shovel Knight, because it's not plain at all. Each knight can conquer the game at a basic level, but with a mastery of the systems in place, their tools can be used to devastating effects. I know a lot of people will still approach this game carefully and at a moderate pace, and to that I'll say, to each their own. But for me, Shovel Knight is a game I've become really passionate about, and I really hope people can start to see the value of digging a bit deeper into the mechanics of this stellar title. Thank you for watching. I really do appreciate anyone taking the time to hear me out on this from start to finish. If you enjoyed my thoughts, please give this video a like and share it around. I want others to be able to love the game in the same way I do. If you have any ideas for another game you want me to cover, let me know in the comments below. I want to make a follow-up video for Shovel Knight, a brief one to discuss the more demanding and astounding feats you can accomplish. For now, I'll simply throw a special thanks to various community members who contribute to examples I've shown off here, and wish you all well. Take care.